If you ask someone what is the oldest locomotive in existence, many will reply with Rocket. While Rocket is one of the most well-known locomotives and a superstar in its own right, the oldest locomotive in existence happens to reside over 400 miles away in London. There, sitting among the marvels of scientific discovery, sits a simple little four-wheeled locomotive. Its shape, apart from its various pistons, is very similar to its grandson. Its name is Puffing Billy, and we are going to look at both the engine and its creator today. For many thousands of years, ruts caused by cartwheels have helped guide and keep carts stable, and it is definitely plausible that this unintentional guide may have been the inspiration for the guided rail, but it was the mining industries that took the innovation to heart, and we do have evidence that wooden rails existed in the mines as far back as the 1530s, when King Henry VIII sat upon the throne. So the idea of guided carts and trucks were not new. By the 1800s, miners had moved from wooden rails to developing a more sustainable system with specially designed track guided wheels. The railway really came into its own and was sparked when in 1804, a young inventor called Richard Trevivick decided to take a boiler, make a few tweaks, add four wheels and set it on the rails in order to settle a bet. This simple engine became the first ever steam-powered locomotive, and even though the engine only had three runs, broke the rails every time, and probably terrified the locals, it heralded the start of the railway industry. While Trevivick was tinkering with Penny Darren, a 25-year-old William Headley was watching in treat. William, a mining director at the Wallbottle Colliery, moved to the Wylam Colliery before Trevivick made his historic unveiling. William was keen to replace the old equestrian operation to coal-fired locomotives. In 1810, both William and the mine's owner, Christopher Blackett, got their chance to experiment in a real-time environment with no disruption or prying eyes from colleagues. The Durham coal field was experiencing a strike with workers over the new bond system. This left the pit practically abandoned and a perfect place to do experiment with the new type of locomotion. Both William and Christopher wanted an engine that worked purely on adhesion rather than the older method of using toothed rails called the Blenkinsop rack system. In 1812, following successful trials with hand crank wagons, William and Christopher developed a prototype travelling machine. It was a combination of a test wagon and a single boiler operating a single cylinder. Not much is known about this prototype, only that it didn't like hills, but it worked well enough for Christopher to invest more in these machines. After the successful demonstration, William got to work and in 1813, Puffing Billy was born. It was one of three sister engines built for the colliery. It had vertical cylinders on either side of the boiler and drove a single crankshaft under the boiler's frame. Following on from Trevelyan's design, William noted that the wheel slippage was a real problem. He surmised that if the sets of wheels were coupled together with a rod, if the wheels slipped, then the others would counteract it. Not much is known about its construction, only that it was in operation in 1814 according to records. Puffing Billy became the world's first commercial adhesion steam locomotive and was put to work hauling wagons from the mines to the docks. It couldn't take a lot of weight, but it was enough for critics to take notice. Horse traders and advocates for the canals and traditional horsepower heavily criticised Puffing Billy, with some spreading rumours that the new engine caused women to suffer from mass hysteria, chickens to stop laying and cow's milk turning sour. They were thrilled when Billy developed its first major fault. No matter how much the plate layers could keep up, at eight tons, Puffing Billy was simply too heavy for the rails. In 1815, William responded by redesigning the engine to have four axles so the weight would be distributed along its length. In 1830, with the development of the wheels and new edged rails, the re engine was rebuilt again and went to a four-wheel design. It could manage a steady 5 miles an hour. 
its twin 9 inch cylinders working a single crankshaft with its boiler getting to around £50 per square inch. And its design could lead on to spark other engineers love of steam engines, that being George and Robert Stevenson. In fact, some of Puffing Billy's design ended up being the inspiration of the world famous rocket. Puffing Billy remained on service for a very long time, and even though we're used to engines travelling up and down the country, Puffing Billy never strayed far from its mine. The new mine's owner decided it was time to retire Puffing Billy, but he didn't want the engine scrapped. He knew how important the engine was, so he lent it at first to the Peyton Office Museum where it was put on display. Eventually, the colliery sold the engine for £200, where it's remained a part of the display ever since. And where is this Peyton Museum, you may ask? Well, it's now known as the Science Museum, and the engine sits on display far from its northern home in London. One of her sisters is also preserved and sits at the Museum of Scotland. Despite its age, the engine is stunningly preserved, retaining all of its original parts and features. Thanks to the way that the engine was preserved, a working replica was able to be produced and is now working at near to Puffing Billy's home in Durham at the Beamish Outdoor Museum. I've only ever seen Puffing Billy just once, and sadly I was too young to remember much of it. But if I ever do go back to London, I can't wait to see the engine once again. The museum is free and it's very easy to find. If you do get a chance, to have a look for Puffing Billy. He may be no rocket, but he is the oldest steam engine that's still around today.